All right, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, I, 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 when I talked with Tarek originally about speaking here, I was still at Reddit. How many people like heard the story of what happened? OK, so a fair number of people. Because it was fairly, I, I became more famous than I probably deserved just because I was cryptocurrency engineer at Reddit, which is this big social media company. Um, so uh, when I, so what happened was, and I'll go through the story, I have no choice but to explain, because like, otherwise you have no idea what I was programming and stuff and why I'm doing these weird things without knowing the story. Um, so uh, uh, because of that position, people are like, whoa, cool, cryptocurrency engineer at Reddit, that's very interesting. Uh, so I became well known. People on like r slash Bitcoin on Reddit, of course, are like, oh, Reddit has a, a cryptocurrency engineer. This is really cool. Um, so anyway, I'm going to talk about the software I wrote. Fortunately, like, although it's done at Reddit, uh, I wrote open source software while I was there. I'm continuing on the same sort of path of open source software I wrote while I was at BitPay. Um, so now I will continue it at another company. I'll explain you know, why I'll be joining BitGo. Is, is anybody from BitGo in the audience tonight? Sadly, no. OK, well, fine. I'll meet them next week. Uh, so anyway, um, so I'll talk about I don't have SPV working, the, the uh, description. I hope people aren't thinking I'm going to show SPV. That is the goal. I have not finished it yet. So I'll explain what I do have working. We'll, we'll cover all that stuff. So this is a technical talk, except that I just have to explain the stuff that happened at Reddit so that you know what I'm talking about. So first of all, uh, I have to start with sort of the basics. So I worked at BitPay. Uh, mostly what I did at BitPay was open source stuff. I was one of the developers on our project called BitCore, which is our JavaScript implementation of Bitcoin. Um, I did many things. I, I can't take credit for everything on this list, but I contributed a lot to a lot of things on this list. Uh, so BIP32 is hierarchical deterministic wallets. Uh, BIP39 is uh, uh, it's like a, a mnemonic. It's a way of uh, generating like HD wallets. BIP70 is payment protocol. Uh, BIP45 is, we actually created BIP45 uh, while at BitPay. This is a, uh, it's a way of doing hierarchical deterministic wallets for multi-sig wallets. Uh, worked on things like uh, uh, making BitCore work in the browser. Again, I didn't, I didn't do that myself, but I contributed something to it. Uh, I spent a bunch of time updating all the cryptography so that it's a lot faster, not by rewriting it, but by just using faster libraries. Um, we made a transaction builder so you can easily make multi-sig transactions. And of course, our two big apps that heavily use BitCore, uh, Insight, which is a block explorer, and Copay, which is a, a multi-sig wallet. And also, I forgot to add to the list, but BitPay.com also uses uh, BitCore. Um, so that's, that's the history of BitCore. Uh, so I'm, people know me. Like I have, you know, I, I was, became associated with, with BitCore. And because I achieved some level of, I don't know, people noticing me in public, uh, I guess this is what drew the, the uh, recruiter from Reddit to me, so we'll get to that uh, shortly. Um, so at, uh, I was happy at BitPay. So I'm doing cool software. I'm writing open source software. It's, it's very neat stuff. Um, happy with what I was doing. Um, a recruiter contacted me. I guess this was, yeah, it was August uh, 2014. Um, for the cryptocurrency engineering position at Reddit, which I had heard of, but I had never considered that I would be the person you know, to, to take on this role. And uh, so one interesting fact about me is that before I went full-time Bitcoin, I was a physicist, so I have a good math background. And if you look at the job description for what a cryptocurrency engineer is, well, the people at Reddit were not really experts on this space, but they knew that if they could get somebody who was an expert in math, they must be capable of understanding this stuff. So. <laughs> So that looked good on my resume from their eyes. So that plus all this experience writing, at, you know, actually implementing uh, many elements of the Bitcoin protocol and stuff like that, that, that everybody could see in our open source code. Um, so that's how they recruited me. Um, but we'll get to how I decided to actually leave BitPay. Um, but first, let me, let me talk about um, basically the start of the code that I want to sort of focus on in this talk. So BitCore was, uh, it was a fine library. So BitCore is derived from uh, uh, Bitcoin JS, which was originally written by Stefan Thomas in 2011. And so Stefan Thomas, for people who are aware, uh, awesome developer. Sadly, he, well, I don't know. I mean, I mean, he's probably not sad about it. But we're sad that he left the Bitcoin protocol and joined Ripple. So he no longer maintained Bitcoin JS. Uh, but at BitPay, we're, we were a full uh, JavaScript and Node uh, stack, 
And we just needed like a, a well-maintained uh, JavaScript implementation of Bitcoin to do all the stuff that we needed to do and link into all of our code and stuff in JavaScript. So uh, that's, where, that's where Bitcore came from. We forked Bit, uh, Bitcoin JS, called it, it was originally called Libcoin. We came up with a cooler name, Bitcore. We did not know at the time that Bitcoin Core would be called Bitcoin Core. So Bitcore is a completely different project from Bitcoin Core, which is sort of the real Bitcoin, right? Um, but anyway, uh, so Bitcore was fine, but what happened is uh, basically it was myself and several other developers that just sort of took over this project and started building the stuff that we needed into this library. And basically we, we built a bunch of technical debt into it and there were some weird architectural decisions made sort of early on that we had nothing to do with that, that really hurt us as we kept building features into the software. So the number one thing that was really annoying was that it worked in the browser and the way we did this was by sort of replicating, so we took, we actually forked Bitcore from the server side component of Bitcoin JS because there are actually two parts, the browser part and the node part and we forked the, no the node part. And so we made everything work in the browser by sort of uh, linking in uh, pure JavaScript implementations of the cryptography and then trying to create the same interface but it wasn't exactly the same. So we ended up with like two different implementations that were not exactly the same. And so a lot of stuff that we had to write, we'd have to write stuff twice. So it's a long story, but there was technical debt in Bitcore. And uh, I wanted to go, just uh, as a side project of mine, this was August 2014, I wanted to make a command line wallet. And so I set about to make this command line wallet. And as soon as I started making it, I realized I did not want to use Bitcore because that's how bad the interface to Bitcore was back then. So I'm like, well, this is a bad sign if I don't even, like I spent all my time working on Bitcore and I don't even want to use it for this project. So I started just creating all of my own primitives and stuff and realized that I was building the foundation to just completely rewrite all of Bitcore. So I originally called it PrivSec, that's short for privacy and security. Wasn't a very good name, but that's just what I called it originally. And then realized that what I'm really doing is rewriting Bitcore. So I renamed it to Bitcore 2 and just kept rewriting. So it's, it's mostly, it's basically a rewrite. There are only a, a few pieces that were sort of copied in and I use things like I link into uh, some of the cryptographic primitives, but a lot of the stuff is just completely rewritten. And it took me about five weeks to write all this, basically all this stuff here on the, on the list. Um, so being very familiar with Bitcore, I basically ignored all the stuff that I thought was done poorly and just sort of rewrote everything. And only a few things that I sort of copy in, the, the rest of it was just rewritten. Um, and then of course I use libraries. So like the hash functions, elliptic curves, and big numbers are all libraries. Uh, and then other than that, pretty much everything else is uh, uh, implemented from scratch. Um, so yeah, so here's this, so just so you have some idea, I, I'm gonna go through the history. So this is while I was still at BitPay. So I implemented this much stuff. This is not quite sufficient for a, a Bitcoin library. Transactions are not on the list, for one. So I got as far as like sort of a bunch of basic stuff right before actually being able to build or validate transactions. Um, and so, let's see, what's my next slide here? Okay, so what happened was, um, so again, I was, you know, uh, 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 happy at uh, BitPay, uh, you know, was not uh, necessarily looking for something new, but I thought this opportunity at Reddit was fascinating. So uh, I uh, talked with the CEO whose name was uh, Yishan, um, and uh, he seemed to get Bitcoin. For some reason, Yishan had some criticism for being anti-Bitcoin. He was not anti-Bitcoin. He actually, in, in my opinion, understood the technology and recognized how it read it. So Reddit's like, you know, it's this giant pseudonymous social media platform with hundreds of millions of users. Um, in Yishan's eyes, uh, Reddit is like a, uh, he called it a, uh, uh, like a city on the internet and it needed a financial system. And I thought that was perfect because he really got the way that Bitcoin could fit in uh, to, to Reddit. Reddit is this internet native community of communities and Bitcoin is a uh, internet native currency and financial system. So he understood it. So here's, uh, so, so because of that, I, talk, I liked Yishan, I interviewed with the other engineers at Reddit um, and I thought, I'm on board. I, I'm, I, I wanna do this, I want to, uh, uh, build Reddit's crypto financial system. So right here I have Yushan's comment. So w when I joined, um, somebody had like casually mentioned to me that Reddit was raising 50 million and I didn't realize that that would happen immediately. So on my second day, 
uh, Reddit announced that it had raised $50 million uh, from people like Sam Altman was the lead investor um, and, uh, and a number of other people like Snoop Dogg was one of the people on the list, which is interesting. And a number of other sort of high profile people were on this list of investors, so they raised $50 million. And uh, uh, they uh, were going to give 10% of the shares that the new investors had bought back to the community in the form of a cryptocurrency. So uh, it sounds, you would think that I joined Reddit to work on this project. I did not actually know about this particular project. Uh, so we were talking more sort of in the abstract when I joined Reddit. Um, so naturally, being the cryptocurrency engineer of Reddit, after I heard about this on day number two for me, I volunteered to make this project happen. Um, so this became known as Reddit Notes. So we came up with this name, I don't know, let's see, it was last September the original announcement was made, and then by, I think it was in December, we made this announcement. Um, so Reddit Notes was going to be uh, a, a digital asset that is backed by Reddit shares. Um, I did a lot of research, so I considered myself pretty knowledgeable about the normal Bitcoin protocol, but I wasn't an expert on Bitcoin 2.0, which is the category that I fit this into. It, it would have been a crypto equity project. It's all the post money uses of Bitcoin is what I call Bitcoin 2.0. So I wasn't an expert on this. So I spent a whole bunch of time researching this. I had never understood how the colored coin protocols work. I think Fl uh, Flavian's here in the audience. Um, I, one of the first, pro there he is. I read Open Assets was like the first protocol. I was very delighted at, I, I found it very straightforward to understand. And that became the benchmark for all the other protocols, which I found usually harder to understand. Uh, so I developed sort of, I don't know if any of the counterparty people happen to be in the audience. Uh, I, I developed sort of a distaste towards counterparty because I found it so much harder to understand how counterparty was working versus open assets that I was like, well, I don't like this at all. Like, I'm not even convinced this is even going to work. So I liked color coins a lot, and I think I saw Matt Corallo over there from, uh, from Blockstream. So I, like, uh, I, I also talked to the guys from Blockstream and really liked sidechains. Uh, and actually, nobody really knew what sidechains were, were until last, I think it was like last... Uh, I guess it was October when, when the white paper came out. So I, you know, the day the white paper comes out, I, I read about sidechains. This is awesome. So I was, I was very excited about sidechains. Um, and so that became a, a really valid option for the technology uh, for this, this uh, project. So I talked to people, talked to Blockstream, talked with Flavian. I talked with uh, some other colored coins groups, um, trying to figure out, do we want to partner with somebody uh, to help build the technology? Uh, and then the big thing, like if you think about what we're doing, like <laughs> the first thing I said to Yishan when, when he announced this project and I didn't, then had a meeting with him, I'm like, you know, this is a giant legal problem. Like, you know, we're issuing shares to millions of people. Like, you know, this is going to be very, very legally difficult. Like, it'll be as much a legal problem as a technical problem. In fact, I, I think it's much harder legally than it is technically. Like, if we wanted to sort of do something simple, we could have done any number of things to launch a cryptocurrency uh, uh, quickly, but doing it in a way that we're giving equity to people and we don't want to be arrested or sued or something like that was way, way harder. Uh, that would have taken, it would have taken, you know, years. Uh, so we did talk with lawyers. Um, I t there was another guy who worked uh, with me on this project. He, his name is Daniel. He was the product manager. And so him and I would talk with lawyers and stuff like that and piece together sort of the big picture view of what this project was. Meanwhile, I wrote software. And so I'll explain some of that as I go through, through all this. I tried to write software that I'm like, well, the legal side of this is going to take long enough. I'm going to build the infrastructure that I know we need no matter what happens. Like we can pick a different protocol or something. But basically, I needed certain pieces of Bitcoin infrastructure. Uh, and so I started building that stuff. So what I did when I joined Reddit was um, I wasn't really sure how to handle my relationship with BitPay. So I wasn't uh, sure if I would continue to be. A, is anybody from BitPay in the audience? No, OK. Uh, so I am on good terms with them, fortunately, because I left BitPay. And it was kind of sad that I left BitPay to join Reddit. Uh, fortunately, I am a, on good terms with everybody. Nobody hates me, at least that they have revealed that we, we talk nicely to each other and stuff. Uh, and in fact, I've contributed source code back to Bitcore since all this stuff happened. But in any case, at the time, I wasn't sure, you know, I need just my own code. So what I did was I just forked Bitcore 2 and just called it full node because I thought in the long run I wanted to turn this into a full node. So that's where the name comes from. Um, and 
I kept writing basic stuff that I needed uh, in this library. So I needed things like a deterministic K for people who are aware. Uh, this is just uh, I regard as being more secure. Uh, if your random number generator is broken, uh, you're, you're uh, still OK if you use uh, a deterministic K. Uh, and I, I added support for transactions and a transaction builder so you could build normal transactions. I even spent about two weeks uh, sort of uh, carefully translating Bitcoin D's script interpreter to JavaScript so that I could validate transactions. So it even has a script interpreter. And all this stuff is, is very well tested. So where possible, I, t I run the same uh, uh, tests uh, that are in Bitcoin D. So there are a bunch of JSON data tests. And I run you know, where I can tell. I run the same test to make sure that my code is, is correct. Um, and then I, I, so I did this for, this is the bulk of my software engineering effort at Reddit went into this, this library. Uh, so, uh, and all of this is open source, and you can look at all this stuff. Um, so here are some of my uh, principles, lessons that I learned from Bitcore that I wanted this library to have. So for one thing, I want it to be internally consistent. If you look at what is now old Bitcore, Bitcore like 0.0.31 or something like that is one of the last versions. Uh, it's not very consistent internally. Uh, it's sort of obvious that it was written by like four different people who just didn't sort of uh, have the same style. So there was a lot of like different variable names. You would have no idea what the inputs to a function are. So like if you're familiar with JavaScript, uh, you have no idea what a type is in JavaScript by default. So like if you don't know, like if a, what is a public key? A public key could be a buffer. It could be a public key object. It could be a hex string. It could be any number of things. So uh, I wanted internal consistency, where a pub key is always and everywhere a pub key object. Pub key buff is a pub key buffer, um, stuff like that. So I just had to sort of get by with the, you know, the sort of weakly typed nature of JavaScript and, and create internal consistency of the, of the library. And then all the, uh, all the code looks the same, too. I wanted to have very, very good test coverage. Bitcore was not, many of the key pieces of Bitcore were well tested, but a lot of it just wasn't tested at all. So I wanted very good test coverage. I don't see why we shouldn't have practically 100% test coverage. Um, I wanted to minimize dependencies. I, I, we had problems with dependencies in Bitcore, um, where if you include a giant dependency, even like SJCL, so for people who are familiar, SJCL is a very good uh, JavaScript uh, uh, cryptography library. And at one point, we had linked in SJCL and only used one itty bitty piece of SJCL. And I cited, you know, not that I don't trust SJCL, but it's, I, I, this is like terrible that we're linking in this giant other library just for one itty bitty thing, and then linking in other libraries and stuff. So I wanted to minimize dependencies, isolate what are sort of the key dependencies that we need, which, which ends up being the cryptographic primitives, and link in those, just well written implementations of the cryptography, and nothing like, just no other weird dependencies. Like there are a bunch of, like JavaScript has a bunch of like just helper libraries and stuff. None of that, because all those things just make it harder to audit the code and understand what's going on. So the more pure the JavaScript is, the better, so that you can just be sure that there, there's no problem. And then just consistency across uh, the, the method names and stuff like, t like that, to string and from string, so you can like turn a private key into a string and from a string and stuff like that. Uh, and then implement all standards. And I, I have not implemented all of them yet, but I've implemented uh, some. Um, and then I also wanted to expose everything. And this is a bit debatable. Uh, by expose everything, I mean even the cryptographic primitives that I use. Um, I found it so annoying when libraries wouldn't expose the primitives when I would need to use them. So I've decided to just expose the entire library. So if you want to use something weird, like if for some reason you want to use you know, a point uh, on an elliptic curve, you probably shouldn't normally be doing this. But if for some weird reason you want to, it is exposed for you and you can use a point. Um, and I did a pretty good job. I, it's not quite 100% test coverage. If you can see my little plot there, it's pretty good test coverage. Um, the only thing that's lacking is, is branch. So everything's like 90 plus percent test coverage, almost 100%, except branches, uh, which are like, you know, just like conditionals and stuff. I test 85% of them, not 100%. So it's not bad, um, although it, it still has room for improvement. And there are 7,000 tests. The reason there are 7,000 is that I include a couple of sort of standard test vectors for things that have like 2,000 tests in them. So I did not write 7,000 tests by hand. Uh, there are some that are just standard test vectors. Um, so the to do yet is what this whole talk is sort of supposed to be about was SPV in a browser. And to my knowledge, no one has done this. I think there is there's one package that goes part of the way. 
I can't remember, um, I think it's, I, I can't remember the package name, but I don't think anybody has fully implemented SPV in a browser. Um, there's one that, uh, there's one called Bcoin, which is uh, SPV in Node, but not in a browser. You know, how do you get the peer-to-peer -peer connection? So I'll talk about that a little bit uh, uh, later. Um, but uh, if you could have SPV in a browser, it would be a better way to have a, a purely decentralized uh, uh, web wallet. And just one additional point before anybody sort of comments, I feel like when I talk about JavaScript, everybody assumes that you're talking about a web page, but it doesn't have to be that way. So you know, uh, sometimes JavaScript apps can be compromised if the web server is compromised. But if you download it locally, JavaScript is just like any other programming language. And you know, so you can run either a browser extension or a local app in, in Node WebKit. Or uh, there are just a number of ways to run uh, JavaScript locally or on a phone, like Apache Cordova. Um, so the reason to pick JavaScript is just because it runs easily on every platform. Not, and you don't necessarily want it to be in the form of a web app that you go to whatever.com and it just loads. Um, so anyway, uh, and then long term to have uh, turn it into a full node so I can basically just run all the same tests that they run on Bitcoin D and know that it's correct. Um, so uh, fortunately, uh, so while I was working on full node, I stayed on good terms with the guys at BitPay, and they pulled in a lot of this code. So uh, you, you'll look at Bitcore. And you'll see, uh, so I contributed a lot of to what is old Bitcore. And then new Bitcore, I also contribute a lot. And that's because they just pulled in you know, Bitcore 2, AKA full node, into Bitcore. So there's now like a lot of the same code in two actually distinct libraries. One is full node, and one is just the new Bitcore. Um, so they're not the same. And uh, uh, the new Bitcore um, has, uh, they, they changed the architecture a lot. So it's different. It's a different, it's a different library. The new Bitcore has a little bit more stuff in it because they, they pulled in stuff from the old Bitcore that I didn't want to pull in and stuff like that. And they've implemented new things. So it's a distinct library, but it shares a lot of the same code. Um, so uh, now, uh, all that stuff was, so I was making a wallet for Reddit is what I was doing. All right? I was making an SPV wallet for Reddit that could hold Reddit notes. Um, now, Reddit notes are, we didn't decide the technology. So SPV actually may not necessarily be possible. So if we did colored coins, for instance, there would have to be a whole lot of extra logic there, and SPV wallet would not be sufficient. But in any case, you pretty much have to have the basics of that stuff working and ready to be able to uh, use these other protocols. So I put aside the decision of whether we're going to go with colored coins or which protocol we're going to go with or whether we're going to do side chains. Uh, for a later time once we sorted out the legal issues, and so I just built this infrastructure. Meanwhile, I was like, well, look, we should do something simpler because you know, Reddit Notes is a, is a very, A, it's, it's technically harder than doing something like just plain old Bitcoin payments, and B, it's, it's legally just next to impossible, plus uh, we can profit. Like we could imagine if we just provided like an actual Bitcoin service on top of reddit.com, this could have been a new revenue generating uh, possibility for Reddit. So I wanted to do something really simple and just integrate Bitcoin payments. And then coincidentally, I did not know we would be talking tonight at the chain headquarters. But what happened was I came over here and talked with uh, the chain guys for lunch one day. And it was, I think it was Devin actually was the one who had the idea to, to do this. We uh, uh, in integrated like Bitcoin payments into Reddit in one day. So reddit.com is open source if you're not aware. So anybody can do this. You can go to, go to the Reddit GitHub and, and get Reddit and make changes to it. So that's what we did. I came over here. And uh, we, in a single day, let you set a Bitcoin address, uh, uh, open up QR codes to tip other Reddit users. So like a comment would have a tip button where it would open up like a QR code. And then there's also a payment request where you could click it and like see a real payment request that could be understood by a wallet. So you can even do things like just directly pay a Reddit user by going to a URL that retrieves a payment request. So in one day, we actually had like integrated, like that's how much simpler this was than, than the Reddit Notes project. We integrated peer-to-peer -peer payments into Reddit in one day. Um, so I thought that was an awesome uh, uh, project. And uh, it's prototype stage, so it's, it's not uh, finished. But uh, uh, that idea, idea had a lot of potential. I was trying to explore those uh, types of ideas um, at Reddit. 
Now, uh, I don't know how else to say this. Like, had I still been at Reddit, I would not be talking about all these things. But so that you understand <laughs> what happened, um, here is just a list of the drama. And all this stuff occurred in a, a five-month period of time. So some things occurred right before I got there, and then the rest of it occurred as I was there. So for one thing, sort of right before I joined, as I was interviewing with Yishan, Yishan was like late one day, and is like, he's like, he shows up, he's 15 minutes late, he's like, I'm sorry, I got all this stuff, we're just dealing, I'm busy. And then I had a great conversation with Yishan. This was while I was still interviewing, right? So what was going on at the time was what we called inside the company Celebgate, but nobody knows that that's just our polite term. Uh, people outside the company know of it as the fappening. And what this was, was where uh, some celebrities had their private photos stolen and shared on Reddit. And it was, it drove like record traffic to the Reddit website, but Reddit employees were very divided on how to respond to this. So some people were like, well, we should just censor these images because this is obviously like, you know, a, a violation of these people's privacy. But then other people were like, well, you know, we don't censor, right? You know, this is the, the, the community is, the, this is just what they're doing. We're not trying to, uh, you know, imagine how it would damage our credibility if we just started censoring stuff that we don't like, right? So it was just very divisive. So that's just issue number one. And the, the, this, you'll just see it starts to add up, like all these things happening at the same time. Another thing that happened at the same time, uh, Reddit decided, and I don't know how this decision was made, but they would move, so Reddit was, formerly a remote, is anybody from Reddit here, by the way? That was one company I didn't ask. OK. <laughs> OK, so no one can, OK. Um, so they decided to move all, the company was like 70% remote. And so they decided to move the entire company to San Francisco. Um, and then, uh, so this was very you know, bad, obviously, to, uh, to some of the people who didn't want to move to San Francisco. I love San Francisco, but a lot of people loved where they lived, and they didn't want to move here. Uh, so, you know, that was it, was, it was bad, especially when, like, most of the company was remote. Um, then I was hired as a cryptocurrency engineer, which isn't really drama, except that it's sort of weird and unusual that they would hire a cryptocurrency engineer. Um, they raised $50 million, so that's good, but again, happening at the same time. Uh, then they announced that they're launching a cryptocurrency backed by 10% uh, of the new shares. So, again, you know, it's just... Nothing, you know, it's just a normal event except that piled on top of this other stuff. Yishan criticized a former employee on Reddit.com. So there's a former employee who, like, said, here's what it was like to work at Reddit and then be let go. And Yishan just sort of, in a lot of people's eyes, sort of tripped up and shouldn't have criticized the guy, but criticized him publicly on Reddit. This would have been, a, you know, a bad event normally. Not that bad, but, you know, just negative. Uh, but again, piled on top of all this other stuff. Uh, and Yishan wanted to move the company to Daly City, not to San Francisco. And I don't know if this was just Yishan, but I think it might have been. Um, so not only were all the non-San Francisco people uh, frustrated about having to move to San Francisco, but all the San Francisco people were frustrated about having to have their office moved to Daly City, which is, you know, it's just not the most glamorous place. Um, so then, uh, after all this stuff, so I was there for a month and a half, Yishan quit. He just stopped showing up, uh, and uh, uh, I, he, he was sick. This is, I'm serious. <laughs> this, this is actually what happened. So uh, he, I, I, he was sick one day, and so I just thought he was sick, and he just wasn't showing up. And then, like, just people started saying weird things, and then, like, uh, two weeks into that, uh, uh, we have a special meeting uh, where uh, Ellen Powell, tells us that, she, that Yishan has resigned, and she's the new interim CEO. Uh, Alexis Ohanian, who's one of the co-founders, joined, and he was in the San Francisco office that day for this meeting. And he was coming back as executive chairman. And then uh, a guy named Dan McComas, who was the uh, 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 leader of uh, Reddit Gifts, which was just a, it's, it's a long story, but it's a sort of merchandise website, and it's what organizes Reddit's giant uh, Secret Santa exchange. He would be VP of product. So they're our new leadership team. Um, and so that happened, I think that was in, I think it was November. Um, during all this time, a bunch of people quit because people, a lot of people didn't want to move. So like every couple weeks, there'd be like two new people had quit, often very important people. Um, we moved to a new office in Soma. So we did have to move to a new office. It wasn't to Daly City, it was to another office in Soma. 
Um, and then they announced the product plan for 2015, and this was, by this time it was in January. And the new product plan just doesn't include cryptocurrency. So all this stuff that I had talked about with Yishan, not on the list. Um, and they had Reddit notes on the list, uh, but the way, well, <clears throat> um, the way Reddit notes was described is, was just as being a very risky project. So one week after that, I was let go. So that's, all this stuff happened in, a, in like a five month period of time. Okay, yeah. So, uh, so I, quick, I did not have a backup plan for what I was going to do. I was completely committed to, uh, to Reddit and doing this stuff at Reddit. Fortunately, like I said earlier, like I became sort of more famous than I deserved by being this publicly, public facing person at Reddit. So a lot of people reached out to me after I was let go, and this was like just two and a half weeks ago. Um, so like all of a sudden, like I was like, what am I? What the hell am I going to do? But then like this this flood of opportunities showed up, uh, and so I tweeted that uh, 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 what did I? I said uh, uh, it's like a, a free market a social safety net. I mean, really, I had like a tremendous number of very good opportunities that I would never have thought uh, had I not been let go from Reddit. Um, so I. Uh, talked with a lot of companies, um, and I made a decision uh, that I would go with BitGo. So I signed a, 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 my offer letter with BitGo like two days ago. So I only wasn't even sure I would be able to talk about this at this uh, uh, talk, but I have signed the contract, and I, it's public now. So I, have, I will be joining BitGo as of next week. Um, and for me, like if you know about, if you know the people at BitGo and what I've done and stuff, this is a very appropriate fit. I did a lot of multi-sig work. I'm the guy that designed BitPay's multi-sig wallet. BitCo's a, a multi-sig company. Uh, there's tech stack is everything I'm familiar with and everything. And, and I like everybody at the company and we've known each other for a while. I know many of the people there. Um, so I've chosen BitGo. This was a, a tough choice, but I, I decided and that's it. Um, and uh, so, but now I'm in the situation where I have, you know, I. I I'm in a very, very weird situation. So I wrote a bunch of code at BitPay. Fortunately, the BitPay developers pulled in a lot of my code. So no matter what happens, my code lives on. Uh, even code I wrote at Reddit, right? So fortunately, because I wrote open source software, MIT licensed software, um, even if I don't use it, the BitPay guys have it, and it's, it's being used today uh, in, in real projects. Um, so no matter what happens, that's good. However, I'm going to keep moving on and developing my software. It's still open source. Uh, and I want to finish this SPV wallet that I was creating for Reddit. Um, so the way to do this, so I, I, I hinted at this, but you can't, of course, directly connect to the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network from a web browser. You just can't. There's no way to open up a normal TCP connection. So uh, what you can do, however, is you can do either WebSockets or WebRTC. WebSockets is a little bit more straightforward. If you have like a server somewhere, you can connect to it if it's like a doesn't necessarily have to be trusted, um, but there's obviously an asymmetry. Where there's got to be a, a, a real server there. I think the right long-term answer is WebRTC. WebRTC lets you do real peer-to-peer -peer connections in a web browser. Um, so if we can, over the long term, this is not going to happen anytime soon, but in any case, I'm going to keep bringing this up because I think it'd be cool if we did this over the long term. We should integrate WebRTC into Bitcoin Core because this will let people have Bitcoin in a web browser. Um, and the advantage is just that this, like, this is on every platform. Like any platform where you have trouble getting Bitcoin on it, the Apple Store doesn't like your whatever, uh, or you know, for other reasons you just can't get your code on that platform, the web is already there. So as, as web browsers, Firefox and Chrome both support WebRTC. Uh, Safari doesn't yet, and I don't know what the status is of all the, the mobile platforms, but it's a web standard and they will support WebRTC. This is the way we can get the Bitcoin peer-to-peer -peer network into, a, into any device. Uh, furthermore, uh, a lot of people also don't know about a database that uh, <clears throat> modern web browsers have called IndexedDB, which lets you store arbitrarily large amounts of data. So web browsers have a database. It is actually, I'm pretty sure it is possible to run a full node in a web browser using IndexedDB as the database and WebRTC for peer-to-peer -peer connections. Um, I think that's probably possible. And I don't think there are any memory restrictions on browsers that I've been able to find. So you can keep things in memory. If, if it doesn't fit in memory, then you put it in the database. So this, it is possible to run like a full node. And you, if you can do a full node, you can definitely do a light node in a web browser. Um, so yeah, so that's the plan here. So that's what I'm working on. 
Um, so the status is I've got things like, like transaction validation is, in essence, what took me forever. Like, if you look at all the other cryptographic primitives and stuff and getting everything to work, it was working towards the point where I could properly validate a transaction. So I have a JavaScript version of the check transaction function. Uh, I think that's what it's called, check transaction in Bitcoin D in JavaScript. It checks all the inputs, runs all the scripts, and validates a transaction. And it passes, I, I mean, it might not be completely correct because it's, it's very difficult to know if I've gotten all the edge cases correct. But it does pass all the tests from Bitcoin core uh, that, that I was able to easily test. Um, so yeah, so make some type of connection manager, decide do I, I'll, I'll probably do WebRTC just because I think it's the right long-term approach. Um, and yeah, and I'll have to set up some gateways. So the way this will work on day one is because Bitcoin Core does not now, and I'm pretty sure it'll be a long time if it ever supports WebRTC. Um, we'll have to have gateways. We'll have to have services, maybe chain.com. I never mentioned this to these guys, but if, I, if my fantasy vision of all this stuff takes out or works out long-term, any of the API services could run like you know full nodes that just have a gateway. So you can connect to a normal full node just via this gateway and then be on the real peer-to-peer -peer network. Um, so that's, that's what I'm doing. Uh, and I want to mention a bunch of other projects here. Um, uh, the JavaScript Bitcoin world is somewhat fractured. And this is pretty unintentional. Um, when we at BitPay forked Bitcoin JS, some other developers forked uh, they didn't fork it, they just adopted the repository and started building on it at the same exact time. So we unintentionally went off on different code bases without realizing that both teams were like serious. So uh, we split off and they built their code, we built our code. Bitcoin JS lib today is very well supported, very well tested library, it's very good. It doesn't have as many features as Bitcore does, but it actually has better tests. They have like almost like 99% test coverage, and it's just a very well vetted code base. So Bitcoin JS Lib is very good, um, and then my code in Bitcore. There's another one called CryptoCoin JS, which is basically a bunch of uh, modules that do different pieces. So if you only need one piece and you only want that one piece, you can link in those modules. And then there's another one called Bitcoin, which I mentioned uh, earlier, which is uh, an SPV node that runs in Node but not in a web browser. So uh, hopefully, I, I, uh, I think, uh, how many people like, have been to like, a, a Bitcoin conference, or perhaps many? Um, so I, my sense is there are too many Bitcoin conferences. I want to organize a JavaScript Bitcoin conference, not anytime soon. But I think it's time like, we need to start specializing. So there will be like, a JavaScript Bitcoin conference in like a year. I mean, not anytime soon. But there are enough people now where like, I, don't even, I don't have time to understand what's going on and all this other stuff. So let's just do JavaScript Bitcoin. Anybody who's doing web browser stuff will have our own conference. So hopefully we'll do that. And then the idea will be, uh, I'd like to hopefully unify somehow uh, all of the projects, maybe have one major JavaScript Bitcoin library. You know, when you're dealing with cryptography, um, we're just wasting time implementing the same cryptography several different times because it all has to be audited, right? We only need it once. So uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to unify. Um, so I'm, I'm almost done. Um, I want to talk about, so I did sort of, I wanted to make a decision that was quick but correct about what I should do next. And I seriously considered the possibility of starting a company. So I'm just going to, I imagine there are entrepreneurs in the audience. If there's anybody who has not yet started a company, uh, I'm sure many of you already have, but uh, I'm going to throw out some ideas. So one idea was Bitcoin Wireless. Um, I, uh, there's another guy doing this. His name is Andrew. Is a Does Andrew happen to be here? Uh, I don't see him. Uh, he's uh, in Boost VC. So he's doing, I think he's doing exactly this. What this was is just paying for wireless internet with Bitcoin. When you go into, a, you know, if you open up your laptop right here, I'm sure you'll see several closed, password protected wireless internet hotspots. If only you could just pay with Bitcoin. Paying with Bitcoin is pretty much necessary because who wants to give your credit card information to random people every single time you want to pay? It'd be way, it'd make way more sense to pay with Bitcoin for wireless internet. So I think that's the right way to do that. So there's a real business idea there. Um, I think there's room for peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, network analysis. So doing things like uh, monitoring whether a transaction has been double spent or not, basically, is one of the key things you can do. Um, and you can do things like even just look for forks, run different versions of, of the software. I, I don't know, Chain is probably doing some of this stuff, but uh, if they're not, you know, there's, there's room for people to do analysis and provide this stuff as a service. 
Uh, you can analyze the blockchain itself. Analyze, you know, if, you, if you've got really good blockchain analysis service, you know, imagine you can track down the guy who stole all of Bitstamp's money, right? Whoever that person is, um, by just doing data analysis as a service. Um, there is one idea I had. That I've only ever had one original idea uh, that's technical concerning Bitcoin. I've never heard somebody else have this idea. I tried to create, while I was at Reddit, I, I, uh, one, of, one of my side projects was to figure out how to make a decentralized Reddit. I wanted Reddit, uh, you know, uh, long term, to not have to depend on you know, these central servers. It'd be cool if you know, it was decentralized, so you're sharing private messages with people. You don't have to worry about whether the company Reddit is going to censor anything, because it's, it's, it's encrypted where it needs to be, and it's uncensorable because it's decentralized. So I think there's a room for that. And I figured out how to do decentralized authent authentication. If you try to sign, like if you try to prove your identity at a certain moment, you can sign the current time. But that doesn't really prove anything, because you can plug in any time. But you can't plug in any latest block hash. The latest block hash is what it is. So if you sign that, you are proving pretty much within that 10 minute time interval that you are in possession of that private key. Uh, so I've never heard this idea before. I think there's room to build on that idea and do something cool with that. Maybe the guys at like one name or something like that. These identity services could use that idea somehow. Or somebody could make a decentralized Reddit. Um, stealth address scanning. So oh, one of the things I, I didn't really cover, but I, I implemented uh, the basics of stealth addresses in my library. And one of the things I wanted to do was, if you, if you understand how stealth addresses works, there's like an unavoidable computational problem of scanning for your transactions. So even if you sort of do it, so either, well, it's a long story. But no matter what you do, you have to do elliptic curve operations on every transaction. And it can't be indexed the way normal addresses can. So just like Chain has a database of addresses, and you can look up any address instantly because it's indexed in a database, you can't do that for self addresses. For every new self address, you've got to do these expensive elliptic curve point multiplications on every transaction uh, to see if they're yours. So this, I think there's room to run this as a service. Most people are not going to want to run a full node. It's even more than a full node. Your, your computer is going to be like super using up all your computational power just doing these, these point multiplications. Um, I think there's room to run this as a service. I think people would be willing to pay for the service of not using the same address over and over again on the blockchain. So it's not on the blockchain. Now, you don't have complete privacy because the service would know which transactions are yours. But at least it's not on the blockchain for anybody to see. Uh, and then you would pay for this. So I think people would pay a small amount of money, basically, for, for to easily be able to do stealth addresses. Um, I think there's an idea for funding open source projects uh, using Bitcoin. Um, one idea I talked about with uh, the guys at uh, the FIVA wallet, I don't see them here, here either. Uh, but uh, 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 it'd be cool if, like, when you just use an open source project, if when you did get pull, and you actually pull new commits, you pay for those new commits. And so you know basically who runs the project. So you could have an interface or something where it just opened up your Bitcoin wallet, and you could easily pay. Uh, it would probably have to be voluntary, uh, just because, look, if it's open source, people are going to get the code anyway. It doesn't have to be open source. It could be closed source. But I'm not aware of anybody basically paying for software in some way that's just integrated into Git or GitHub or something that makes it really easy to pay for the latest version of software. It could be open source, could be closed source. It could open up just new avenues, like uh, you know, if we use uh, Lighthouse to crowdfund stuff. What if we just integrated Lighthouse into GitHub or something and just made it so that like, you, know, you could easily crowdfund? Maybe somebody, here's an idea. What if you had somebody wrote the code, they keep it closed source, and they say, please crowdfund to make this closed source software open source? So you can see the software. You can verify it works. Right? You can verify it is what they say it is. You can verify they're not just copying it. You can verify the author. And then crowdfund to make it open source. Right? Integrate that into GitHub. There's a real business idea there. You could fund your pro the, this project itself could be funded that way. Right? <laughs> um, so there's, yeah, I think there's a real idea there. And then finally, you could do a social media website like, oh, I don't know, Twitter or Facebook, and integrate Bitcoin payments into that social media website. Um, and make a new, I think there's a market for an outright new social media website. Um, like, uh, uh, not just integrating it into a current one, but a social media website where payments are integrated sort of at the core of what it is. And this has just not been possible until Bitcoin. 
So I think people have just not even bothered to think about all the possibilities here, but think about how many social media websites there are. There are millions. Craigslist, Wikipedia, there are so many of them. There's room for one or like a thousand social media websites that integrate payments for different reasons. Um, so that's it. Uh, so I'm uh, in conclusion. Uh, I am working on SPV. Uh, I uh, uh, will continue working on full node. Um, the next steps are basically pretty much the peer-to-peer -peer protocol, and then creating these gateways. And you know, I mean, it's it's not trivial, but that those are my next steps. Um, and uh, please follow me on Twitter or GitHub. Uh, you can get my public key and all that stuff on Keybase. Um, so that's it. Thank you. No, because the, the peer to peer stuff doesn't work. So there's nothing to show there. I would show you my library, except that this is not my computer for complicated reasons. But you can see it yourself. Uh, just git pull it, run the test. There, there are examples and everything in it. Um, so you can see either look at the, the test code, where you can see how to use it. And you can also look at the examples and see how it works. Um, if you want to see SBV working in JavaScript, look at Bcoin. Bcoin has the logic there. It's just that it only works in Node, so it doesn't work in a browser. So it's not quite good enough. Uh, but, it's, but it is good. And so if you want to see that working, if, if you, if you want to implement it yourself or something like that, start with that one. And then, of course, like Bitcoin J. Uh, Bitcoin J, I think, was the first one to do this. So uh, you know, it's not JavaScript, but at least you, know, you can see it working there. Um, I'm not aware of any other. Does anybody know? How many times has SPV been implemented? I'm not actually off the top of my head aware of any others. I, I'm only aware of Bitcoin J and Bcoin. Oh, OK. There's a Haskell one, too. OK, interesting. Um, yeah. All right. Other questions? Yes. Um, if somebody wants to contribute to the whole node, is there anything in particular that you would want if you're looking for it? Today? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what. I talked with, just today, I talked with a guy named JP Richardson, who works on CryptoCoinJS. And he offered to collaborate with me to make SPV happen on full node. I actually have a list of issues if you want to look at the issues. But the issues are all high level stuff. Like, I want to implement merge avoidance. Uh, no one has done this yet either, but this is also like a totally non-obvious thing to do because there needs to be like a merge avoidance protocol. You got to figure out how to, how is the you know the payer going to talk to the payee and stuff like that. So that's not trivial, um, and there are a couple of non-trivial issues like that. But if you want to just implement SPV, <laughs> I will pull that in. I would gladly pull that in and not do it myself if you want to beat me to it. So obvious stuff like that. There are other things like there are minor things. Um, uh, if you look at the, the sort of class structure, for lack of a better term, in JavaScript, it's all the same, but sometimes I just haven't finished things. So sometimes there are obvious functions that are just missing, or you know, things like the test coverage is not 100% yet. So look at the, the uh, and, and there's, there's a test coverage tool that I use, so you can just look at what are the conditionals that I haven't bothered to test yet because I haven't had time. Write a test for that, I'll pull that in. Um, so that would be the easiest thing if, if you do want to contribute. Um, there's another question over here. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think the people that are going to overcome that are the people that are really immersed in the space. So the question is, I, I'm going to start repeating the questions because I don't know if the audio and stuff is recording it. So the question is basically like, you know, how do you how do you deal with the legal side? Because we can build the technology, we can make it work, but if the legal side is this giant headache, you know, what do we do about this? Um, my first impression is, unfortunately, like the legal system. Uh, it's obviously designed for a different technology. It just has nothing to do, like it's, it was clearly designed for the 1930s. Things like uh, the money transmitter regulations and, and the SEC. The SEC is what concerns crypto equity. It was, it was all written in like the 1930s, the basics of all this stuff. Um, it was clearly written for another time. Um, the, the regulation is, is easy to interpret in a way that is extremely broad. Um, so like 
everything we're already doing in, in, in some interpretation is just regulated and we should all go to prison for just even running the software or something, right? If you interpret it that way. So the only way this is going to happen is people are going to go to court and it's going to be settled by judges. So this is going to be a multi-year long process where there are going to be companies that have to be willing to get sued and go to court and battle it and spend years dealing with it. So it's going to be a very expensive process. A, a lot of people are going to leave. Um, I've seriously considered leaving myself. Before I joined BitPay, I almost moved to Panama. It's a long story. But uh, uh, it, it's really like it's, it's so ridiculous that it's, it, it is the harder problem, in my opinion. Um, so fortunately, I think that the regulators are not 100% irrational. So I think there's hope that we can sort of move things in the direction that we want. But I don't know. I, I have no simple answer to, to all that stuff. Like, it's going to have to take the more well-funded companies are going to have to dedicate money to the problem over a long period of time. It's probably going to be like any other regulated industry, actually. There will probably be two things. Here's, I'll call this right now. If you look at the history of regulated industries, the bigger companies actually want regulation because they can keep their competitors out of the market. So there will be larger companies in this space that actually can afford the regulations, and so they don't necessarily want to change them, or they create new regulations that are, oh, we want to protect the consumer, but it also makes it like next to impossible for a startup company to do it without having 10 or $50 million in funding. I definitely think that's going to happen, but at the same time, in parallel, what's going to happen is you can use this technology completely anonymously on the internet. So there's going to be a purely uh, internet-based economy, there already is, but it's going to grow, and there's going to be a purely, a large, purely internet-based economy that simply cannot be regulated because nobody even knows who it is. There's no way to find these people and arrest them. They're in other countries. So that element is going to grow, and that element, I actually think over the long term, is going to be the bigger element. That, that economy, I believe, and this is, this is a long-term prediction, I really think that economy is going to be bigger than the real-world economy. The digital economy will be the primary economy. And that's how this stuff is going to replace uh, fiat currencies and stuff like that. It's not that fiat currencies will necessarily go away. You'll still use it when you go to the store in real life. But you may not go to the store anymore. You might buy something on the internet. So um, I think that's how it's going to play out. So if you do stuff purely digital and you live in Panama, uh, there's just no reason why you can't do whatever you want to do. And so the regulations don't even matter. But don't do anything criminal, just, just saying. At least it's not expensive that way. <laughs> yes? So the, motiva the motivation is several fold. So first of all, um, turning it into a, a full node is it's sort of an ideological thing for me. In, in my opinion, there should be a, uh, like a, you know, a garden. There should be like a forest of many implementations of Bitcoin. Now, this is going to take a long time to get to that point uh, because it's very, 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 very hard to know if you've implemented things correctly. Um, so you know, if I turn this into a full node, it's going to be many, many, many years before we even figure out how to know if it's correct enough for someone to actually bother running it as an actual full node. The reason to do this is purely just for testing. So you can run exactly the same tests that you run on Bitcoin Core. There are some uh, pull tests that are run on Bitcoin Core. You should be able to run the same test, the same integration tests that are run on Bitcoin Core. Make sure that you know, when you download the blockchain and stuff and everything just works integrated completely correctly. And that v verifies indirectly all of your cryptography and all, all of that stuff. If it validates and runs against the same exact test that Bitcoin Core runs against, then you can trust it to sign a transaction, right? Or at least you have higher confidence to, to sign a transaction. Now, uh, another thing that's occurred to me is, so JavaScript is a good language. So one of the things they're doing in Bitcoin Core is to take the consensus code and put it into a library. Uh, Node is uh, written in C++, and you can link into C++ libraries. So you could have, you could take the consensus core of uh, Bitcoin, D of Bitcoin Core, link that into Node, and have a sort of pure JavaScript implementation of everything else, which 
there would be reasons to run that. Basically, if you, if you know JavaScript, if the rest of your stack is JavaScript, like it is for a lot of people, you would probably prefer to run that because you could more easily modify it. You could use it with the rest of your code. So the way this might work out is you might link into the C++ consensus part, but then everything else uh, is whatever. It's just written in JavaScript. So that's another way this, this could, uh, could work out. Um, but, all, but really, in the long term, I think you know, I, I do have the long-term vision in mind of I, I, I think it should at least be possible uh, for people to run a, a, a plainly pure JavaScript implementation of Bitcoin. I, I think most people wouldn't because it's slower, except um, it might be the only way to do it in a browser. So maybe one day your smartphone has like a, a, you know, a, a petabyte of storage space, and you can easily store the entire blockchain, and you've got all the bandwidth you need. You might not actually mind running a full node on your phone. Uh, and the way to do that might be in a web browser, especially if we do things like if we don't increase the max block size, as computers become more performant over time, um, I, you could, it's totally reasonable that you could just, in the future, you know, five years from now, if the max block size is still one megabyte, you could just run a full node you know, uh, in a web browser, and it would be totally fine. It, that might be the way that you do it on your phone. Um, so you don't even want a light node. You just want an outright full node. Um, so there are a lot of reasons to do it, um, but it, that's more long term. I'm not going to implement the full node stuff. Again, that's another thing. If somebody wants to bother to do it, I would love to pull in that code. Um, but for me, it's not a priority. The priority is SPV in a browser, because I think that's the more useful thing. Yes. Do I think we're going to have an increased max block size? In my opinion, um, this is a really tricky issue, because I can totally appreciate both sides of the argument, because some people want to increase it, some people don't. I'm not sure what's going to happen, because if we increase it, the entire community has to agree, right? You pretty much have to have all the miners, maybe not all, but most of them, and it's going to be really bad if, if they don't all agree. They should really all agree. And pretty much everybody running a full node should also agree. Um, so it's not going to be easy to get everybody to agree to this. Um, so whether it will happen is a completely di different question than whether it should. In my opinion, uh, Jeff Garzik actually just tweeted the other day, I think, uh, uh, the right answer to this. No matter what happens, we will need additional decentralized infrastructure on top of Bitcoin uh, that does payments. So the blockchain is not the answer to every single question. You know? Not everything needs to be on the blockchain. When you do a Bitcoin transaction in the future, you know, a lot of, think about how many transactions occur today on ChangeTip. ChangeTip is uh, very popular. And it's all off-chain. There are going to be a lot of transactions that occur that way. And Bitcoin ends up becoming like the protocol, the standard protocol, just like the internet. Just, the, just like the internet is a network of networks. It links your land to other people's lands. Bitcoin is the protocol that links these little economic subsystems together. Um, so it is not necessarily the case that we'll increase it. And I don't know what's going to happen this year, because I think there's a good chance, just if you just look at the rate that transactions are increasing in volume, that we will hit the limit this year. So um, it's probably going to look really bad to the, to the outside world to see, like, what do you mean it costs a dollar to send a Bitcoin transaction? I thought this was for microtransactions. Um, so I don't know whether it will happen, but uh, either way, uh, we need additional decentralized infrastructure on top of Bitcoin. Sidechains are one approach to that. I've talked with other people, like there's uh, 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 a guy named Oleg Andreev. Uh, he has a really good idea. He, 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 he told me about uh, a, a, just a totally different way to build decentralized payments on top of the blockchain. So it's not, it's not in the blockchain. It's, it's, uh, it's an extra sort of meta protocol. So he's, he's working on that. Uh, of course, there's Ripple and Stellar. Those are approaches to that. I think they need to fix their protocols first. But if they can do that, then that's another way. Um, so, yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But no matter what, we have to have other ways to send Bitcoin around besides just putting everything on the blockchain. All right.